um, thank you uh, to the organizers uh, for inviting me for this talk and uh, thanks everyone for participating. Uh, it's very nice to have uh, like so much participation, even though it's an online uh, conference. Um, so the, my uh, talk is going to focus on uh, some recent work uh, uh, that I uh, completed with uh, my collaborators at Perimeter Institute, at uh, my institute in Potsdam, and also <clears throat> Pablo Bosch, who's at the University of Amsterdam and was also one of the leaders of this uh, project. So I think uh, um, in the first uh, talks uh, uh, here, we heard uh, um, a lot about, uh, you know, the overall gravitational wave signal uh, that we currently detect uh, with uh, LIGO and Virgo, and also uh, about perhaps more of the in spiral phase where we can use, uh, you know, these perturbative tools uh, to get a handle over the signal. Uh, instead, I will focus on the very final phase of the binary merger, which is the ring down. So technically, the ring down is uh, the gravitational wave emission from a highly perturbed black hole, a single black hole. Um, and this is what's uh, uh, depicted in this uh, snapshot from a, a numerical relativity simulation actually produced by some people at my institute. Um, and the word ring down is supposed to make you think of a bell that has been struck and starts uh, ringing, uh, uh, you know, for a certain amount of time until the, you know, the sound dies down. Um, however, uh, Professor Aaron Zimmerman uh, recently at a workshop uh, uh, mentioned that uh, more than a bell, a black hole uh, sounds like a table that we've struck with, with our fist because uh, the signal is not that loud and uh, uh, it dows, dies down much faster than that of a bell. But I guess a bell is still a nice picture to have in mind uh, in this case. Um, in, uh, in general, a perturbed black hole can be the result of many different processes. However, in, uh, in, real, uh, in the real universe, the only process that is strong enough to perturb the black hole so that we can detect the ring down is a binary merger. So let's put the ring down in the context of a binary merger. Um, of course, as you all know, uh, we uh, the main part of the signal is given by the in spiral between uh, the two black holes, which we can treat with some uh, semi-analytic tools. Uh, this is followed by a short, very nonlinear phase, the merger, uh, which we can only treat really with numerical relativity simulations with high enough accuracy. And then we have uh, uh, the, the phase we are interested in, the ring down. So uh, you need to bear in mind that this follows this very nonlinear phase of the merger. Uh, but however, this is again a somewhat linear phase where we can use black hole perturbation theory of a single black hole uh, to describe the signal. And what is this uh, description of the signal that we should have in mind? Um, black hole perturbation theory tells us that the signal uh, can be written as a sum over the modes of the single perturbed black hole. Uh, so you can see we have a sum over these modes, the Q and M's or quasi-normal modes with some amplitudes and phases. And these modes are have complex frequencies with a real and an imaginary part. So they are modes that oscillate in time, but also have a decaying amplitude, like you can see in, in this signal. The modes are categorized by their angular numbers, L and M, which define you know, their pattern in the sky. Uh, but then they also have this overtone number. There's an infinite tower of uh, these overtone uh, modes with n equals zero, giving you the mode that survives the longest in the signal. So it's basically what you see at late times. And then at higher n, there's modes that decay faster. And so these are only visible in the early phases of the ring down. 
And uh, one more thing you, you should bear in mind is that uh, the spectrum of modes uh, is uh, uh, uniquely characterized by the mass and the spin of this perturbed black hole, of, of this final object, uh, the merger remnant. Um, and this is the reason why the uh, ring down is such an interesting phase, because it tells us about uh, the remnant. And it's also connected to the no hair theorem, uh, because if there was an extra charge, an extra um, hair, uh, this would show up in, in the spectrum. And so it was always thought that the ring down would be a very good phase uh, to test uh, general relativity. Um, so the study of the ring down has been going on for many years, uh, since uh, more or less the 70s with uh, Tukowski's work. Um, but of course, it's only now that we have real data and we can really analyze the ring down like people were imagining years ago. And so what are currently uh, the LIGO, Virgo, and Kagra collaboration doing with the ring down? Well, they're learning about, as I said, the remnant properties, the mass and the spin, especially for signals that, uh, you know, uh, are very massive in, in the mass of the binaries. And so almost only the merger and the ring down fall in the sensitivity of the instruments. Uh, but uh, again, uh, the main reason uh, of um, excitement about the ring down is testing general relativity. And this can be done in a more agnostic way with uh, what are called the consistency tests, where you study the late time signal, merger and ring down, and the early signal, the in spiral, and you compare predictions from the two. Um, and as I said, this is a, a more general test, but it's not going to be as sensitive to modifications of GR as tests that are very specific to the ring down. So this is the last, uh, you know, category of results that have been obtained with the ring down. These are tests that focus, you know, that uh, kind of isolate the ring down part of the signal and try to look for, for example, deviations in the frequency of the quasi-normal modes. And the best way of, do this, of doing these kind of tests is to identify more than one mode, you know, remember those L, M, and N modes, more than one in the ring down. And that way you can break the degeneracy between the mass and the spin and these potential deviations from general relativity. And so this is kind of the, the frontier uh, of ring down research is something that we are, that the collaboration is already trying to do, but there's a bit of controversy um, around whether we've really detected more than one mode or not. Um, so um, this is because the ring down is this short part of the signal that is decaying in amplitude. And so it, with LIGO and Virgo, we cannot accumulate a lot of SNR uh, in the ring down. But likely for us, uh, future detectors will do much better at this. So we will have, uh, for example, LISA in 10, 15 years, uh, which will see um, more massive binaries for which the ring down will really fall, you, you see in the sensitivity uh, sweet spot um, of the instrument. Um, but the same can be said for future ground-based detectors like the Einstein telescope and the Cosmic Explorer, again, in 10, 15 years. Um, in this case, it will be, you know, in the same frequency range, in this, the same type of sources that we are already seeing. But thanks to the improved sensitivity, the ring down will accumulate more uh, uh, signal to noise ratio. And we think that we will for sure with either LISA or the Einstein telescope or both see multiple modes in the same ring down and therefore be able to test uh, general relativity very well. So um, the fact that we have currently data available finally for the ring down and that we will you know, see the ring down so well with future experiments is making us realize that we actually have still some uh, limitations in our understanding of how to analyze the data and how to interpret the data. So on the both the data analysis and the theory side, I think. 
On the data analysis side, uh, as I anticipated, there's been some uh, debate, some archive battles, I would say, between different groups claiming that we, yes, we've detected multiple modes in one, in a single ring down, or no, we haven't detected multiple modes yet. Um, on the theory side, um, the, um, the question is whether uh, we, uh, have a good way of distinguishing the ring down from the merger uh, because you know one phase follows the other and it's very important to know when you can apply your black hole perturbation theory prediction because if you apply it in the wrong phase you might see deviations from the GR where uh, really uh, what you're observing is the merger and not the ring down. And connecting to the, this question is, um, do we understand what the ring down would look like, even the ring down itself, but beyond linear order in perturbation theory? Because uh, um, early in the ring down and close to the merger, there could be nonlinear effects uh, showing up that again, we could potentially confuse with deviations of GR if we don't know how to um, describe them appropriately. So um, this was uh, the, the situation where we start, started working on our projects. And these were the types of questions that we were trying to answer. Uh, our main goal is to try under, and understand what type of nonlinearities could take place during the ring down. So before I dive into our results, I want to once again, maybe summarize, you know, completely for you, what are the predictions of black hole perturbation theory at the leading order? So what people are right now using to analyze and describe the ring down. So um, black hole perturbation theory is going to be, you know, solving perturbatively the vacuum Einstein's equation. So we're going to write the metric as uh, some background black hole metric plus a perturbation. And then we're going to use uh, some magic to go from this nonlinear uh, tensorial equation to a more simple uh, equation for your perturbation variable that is, you know, related to this original H mu nu. And this uh, equation must be uh, associated with some physical boundary conditions. And uh, these are um, outgoing boundary conditions at infinity because we don't want any radiation coming in. We are describing this isolated black hole responding to a localized perturbation. And at the horizon, if we are in general relativity and we're dealing with a you know, non-exotic black hole, we want only ingoing boundary conditions. We don't want anything coming out of the horizon. And so once you solve these equations with these boundary, with these asymptotic boundary conditions, what you find are these modes that I already mentioned at the beginning of my talk, the quasi-normal modes. And then again, uh, let me uh, summarize the properties of these modes. Uh, they have complex frequencies, which uh, um, let you know that they decay over time. They depend only on the mass and the spin as a manifestation of the no hair theorem. They have some annoying properties of divergence at uh, the bifurcation surface and spatial infinity, which uh, make uh, make it hard to deal with them sometimes. And uh, again, another uh, unhappy property is that uh, the spectrum of these modes doesn't form a complete basis. So this means that uh, there is always going to be some parts of the ring down that cannot be described in terms of quasi-normal modes. Uh, but a linear theory, this is not a problem because we actually understand these extra, extra features very well. And finally, the, another important property is that these modes are, um, are, although they're not a complete basis, they are orthogonal. Uh, so this is, you know, uh, for sure true for Schwarzschild. For Kerr, it's a bit of a, a work in progress. Uh, but uh, let's assume, even if you think only of Schwarzschild, um, that this is the case, then you know that modes with different n, l, or m are orthogonal to each other. 
Okay. So uh, this ends my uh, summary of leading order black hole perturbation theory for the ring down. And we can finally start wondering uh, what's beyond this. Uh, what, what happens at higher orders in perturbation theory or really at the nonlinear level? So in trying to answer this question, we decided to uh, focus on a very simple toy model. This toy model is made up of a small black hole in ADS, although these anti-desitter boundary conditions are not very important uh, in the end. Uh, we focus on spherical symmetry to try and reduce the degrees of freedom. But then once you are in spherical symmetry, you lose gravitational waves, so you need to introduce a scalar field to probe the ring down. But then again, this is not a problem because uh, the scalar field ring down and the gravitational ring down are pretty much the same. They happen on the same black hole background. And now that we've reduced the problem to this uh, nutshell, uh, we can evolve nonlinearly the coupled system of the metric and the scalar field. And the final ingredient in the toy model is our ability to put some very nice initial data at the beginning of our simulation um, that contains only one scalar quasi-normal mode. Okay, so let's look at the uh, time evolution of this system. Uh, in particular, we're looking at the absolute value of the scalar field at uh, the ADS boundary. So because we put in a single quasi-normal mode of the scalar field, say with the overtone number n equals one, then at linear order in perturbation theory, because the modes are orthogonal, we know that what we put in is what is going to come out. We're not going to excite any other mode because of this orthogonality. And this is what you see at early times. You see the, you know, the exponential decay of that mode exactly as, as predicted. Now, what happens at uh, late times, though? At late times, we see that these you know, exponential decay is, is replaced by a different exponential decay. And we realized that these were actually the fundamental modes of the scalar field with positive and negative frequency. That's why you don't see a straight line, you see some wiggles, so you see the product between the two. So this mode was not predicted by linear theory. So we thought, ha, huh, we found a nonlinearity in the system. So if you want to check if something is nonlinear, first of all, you want to, you know, you want to see this nonlinearity. So you want to see that the relation between the perturbation and the excitation is nonlinear. Um, and this is exactly what we found. We found that the relation between these amplitudes is cubic. And indeed, you can understand this from the equations of motion. The scalar field is going to enter you know, excite the metric through the stress energy tensor, which is quadratic. So the metric perturbation is quadratic. And then this excites a scalar field perturbation at a cubic level, you know, coupling with the original perturbation. So one more in the ingredient in this nonlinear picture is the black hole. As I said, the metric is also being sourced at the quadratic level. And indeed, we see that the black hole area, this A, is growing over time uh, during this process. Um, this is because uh, you can physically understand this growth by the fact that the original mode that we put in is going to have a flux into the horizon. Uh, with a decaying uh, flux and with a quadratic amplitude in the field. So um, we are seeing the nonlinear process both on the scalar field side and on the black hole side exactly as we expected. Here I'm overplotting the numerical result and the, the analytic prediction of this formula. So uh, we can now put together all the pieces of the puzzles uh, of the, this puzzle and uh, say that what we're seeing are absorption-induced mode excitations. And there's a nice way of you know, uh, interpreting this excitation, uh, which is the following. Um, I told you that uh, for a given black hole, 
uh, modes with different, for example, overtone number are orthogonal. So when we put in our perturbation, we don't excite any other mode. But now we've realized that the black hole mass is not fixed. So the black hole mass is going to change over time. And once uh, we have a new black hole, we have a new spectrum of modes because they depend on the mass. And so with respect to the new modes, the original mode is not orthogonal anymore uh, with respect to all other overtones. And so in other words, we should re-expand that original perturbation in terms of the modes of the new black hole. And this is what we see happen in the simulations. And this was also a nice realization because it meant that we could find, you know, some nice analytic formulas to predict these, uh, these excitations. And uh, we could also, you know, um, mimic these excitations by making the uh, black hole mass uh, time dependent. Um, and I, we think that this is going to be useful in the future to, um, you know, um, look at this problem in more complicated settings away from our toy model, because you can do a more simplified simulation with just a time dependent black hole mass, rather than looking at the full nonlinear uh, problem. Okay. So uh, this was all uh, very, uh, you know, nice and tied together in our toy model. But unfortunately, as I mentioned at the beginning, this was a simplified simulation. Um, and uh, what we are really interested in uh, for, you know, the purpose of gravitational wave observations are black holes that are asymptotically flat and not in ADS, and are gravitational perturbations rather than scalar field ones. So uh, we started uh, thinking about uh, the Schwarzschild case, and already there, using some analytic predictions, we could see that you know these nonlinear excitations could add uh, to the gravitational wave at early times in the ring down in a significant way. So we think this might be uh, relevant uh, for observations, perhaps uh, you know in the future when the SNR is higher. For Kerr, we don't have uh, quantitative results yet, uh, but we uh, can already tell that uh, not only the black hole mass is going to evolve with time, but also the spin. And this is going to couple, uh, for sure, different angular numbers and not just different overtones. So uh, I'm, I'm going to head towards the conclusions by trying to draw some general lessons about uh, the ring down that we've learned in our toy model and uh, from uh, some, uh, you know, initial explorations in Schwarzschild. So the first lesson is that uh, overtones or in general modes in the ring down can be dynamically excited by nonlinear processes, which means that uh, the mode amplitude can evolve with time. Laura, you have another five minutes. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So the, the second lesson that we learned is that uh, the mass and the spin of the black hole can evolve with time. And this means in turn that uh, the frequencies of the quasi-normal modes can evolve in time because they, they depend on this mass and spin. And both of these lessons are particularly relevant for the early ring down, for these early times. Um, this is because, uh, you know, nonlinear processes are going to happen here, and then you're going to settle into the linear regime down here. And this is particularly problematic because if you remember at the beginning of the talk, I told you that higher modes um, are going to decay fast. So the early times are exactly the times when you have some hope of detecting these extra modes that you need for testing general relativity. Um, so other prospects, uh, you know, other avenues that we're uh, thinking about uh, after this, this initial work is, of course, as I already mentioned, uh, extending this to short shield and care. Um, especially using uh, perhaps uh, this uh, um, linear evolution on a time-dependent background, which seems to be the easiest way of exploring these um, ex nonlinear excitations. 
Um, another interesting um, aspect of this work is that we realized that in the extremal limit of Kerr, uh, things could be slightly different because it seems that um, the excitations might become more adiabatic in nature so the, that um, the evolution of the black hole mass might be kind of slow compared to other time scales in the problem. And this might uh, uh, suppress nonlinear excitations in, in this limit. So it will be interested, uh, interesting to explore this direction. And finally, there might be more, you know, really astrophysically uh, or fundamental physics relevant settings where either the black hole mass or the black hole spin are evolving in time, and uh, this might cause nonlinear excitations. So you can think of, uh, you know, mass accretion through accretion disks, which, you know, produces a time dependent black hole mass. Uh, or you can think of uh, uh, super radiance so where uh, the black hole is being spun down, so the spin decreasing decreases with time. So um, I think I'm gonna uh, leave you with my summary and thank you and uh, uh, take questions if you have any. <laughs>